the more you can kind of make an impression on a girl with your opener, the more you can um, make the conversation unique with the opener as opposed to a boring small talk conversation, um, the more you can kind of have the girl a little off balance and make the conversation more memorable in that way, right off the opener, the better off you're going to be. As someone new to game and still nervous about approaching, I'm wondering if it's advisable to just use the same exact opener pretty much every time so I don't have to think of new ones on the spot and then maybe have a few pre-planned follow-ups too. There's probably an analogy to chess here because I know personally I play as white. I open every single game with e4 and then res they respond with e5. I always respond with d4, the Danish gambit, pretty much every single time. So I don't have to think about those first two moves. I've already decided on a line that I enjoy playing and I can just practice getting good at the kinds of games that develop out of that one opening. Is this pre-planned approach tenable and smart in game? at least as a newbie? And if so, are the opening lines you are there opening lines you recommend for a newbie? Or can you give tips for developing our own go-to opening pass? Thanks. And he just gives initials LM as his name. So thank you, LM, for that question. Okay. Um, this is a great question, not just because it deals with chess and game, but also because it is a really good metaphor that he's drawing. And it's actually much deeper than even he imagines, I think. So I'll answer his first question first, and then I'm going to go into some depth. So his first question <clears throat> was basically um, that... It's adv is it advisable to do the same exact opener every single time as a newbie so you don't have to think of new ones on the spot? And the answer, like the answer to everything in game, is it depends. That's the answer to everything in game. You just have to deal with it. And here's what it depends upon. It depends on what areas you're weak in and what areas you're strong in. If you have a lot of approach anxiety and you're nervous about even saying anything, should you have a canned opener that you can say every single time? Absolutely yes. Right, almost, almost like emphatically, enthusiastically, yes, because that just gives you one less thing to think about. It gives you far fewer excuses, and it, it keeps you from tripping over that first thing and getting your own way. So, if your major problem is approach anxiety, you're just flat out scared to approach, then having something canned at least until you get over that approach anxiety and having something that's a go to that you're gonna say every time, I think is totally fine and good. All right. However, once you are past the approach anxiety, doing exactly the same thing every single time is a bit of a crutch. Um, and also it will start to, over time, get old. It will start to get stale and it will start to actually work less well because you are no longer in the moment while saying and doing this thing. So the very same thing that worked at first will likely stop working. There's an old sort of a phrasing game. They say, uh, yesterday's epiphany is tomorrow's crutch. Right. So um, it does get old. It does stop working to the same degree. Also, if you say the same thing every single time, it will be uncalibrated. For example, if you're saying something very cocky and hard hitting, that may work really well in one environment. It might not work as well in another environment. Now, you could solve that, obviously, by having a different go to opener for a few different environments. But now you are expanding your repertoire even there. Um, so that lack of flexibility could be a problem as well. The other problem that comes up when guys do this one opener every single time approach is that they get very comfortable with the conversations that come off that opener, which is a good thing, uh, at least to an extent, as this person mentions in the question. However, it can mean they become complacent and miss a lot of other things going on. So let's say you start with a stock opener like, um, hey, you're cute. I hope you're not crazy, right? Say that was your opener, which that's more of an online opener, the live opener, but I use it because it is polarizing and because it'll get very specific responses. And you get used to all the things she might say, like, oh, I'm not crazy, or crazy can be fun, or who the hell are you to call me crazy, or um, is that your pickup line? Or you get used to these, these various things, you might get off of that. Um, and then what if all of a sudden, and, and so maybe you get used to following up by, um, by uh, explaining your thoughts on crazy and then following up with your name, because those are like your invisible threads. Those are the conversation topics that usually come up. So it's the, you know, you're cute, are you crazy? Uh, and then you follow up with, how some girls are crazy, and then you follow up with giving your name. Well, that's all well and good, um, but let's say that the girl says, um, you're cute, but in a, I'm in a hurry, I have to go right now, and then you're like, no, no, it's cool, but my opinion on crazy is, and instead of going ahead and closing and taking advantage of the fact she's responding too quickly and understanding there's a time constraint, instead, you've just wasted your time 
um, or you're wasting her time and you're trying to keep her too long, she's probably going to get anxious and not be happy about it and you may lose your chance to close. And if anything, you're showing that you're socially uncalibrated and socially unadept and probably losing value in the process. So blindly following a pattern without thinking about it is actually quite problematic after a certain point. Now, again, if your problem is just with approach anxiety, by all means, use the same opener every single time. If your problem is with game in general and you're learning game in general, now you might want to expand your repertoire a little bit or at least be a little more flexible in terms of what you're going to say and how you're going to follow up on it. Now, even at an advanced level, I do think it's a good idea to have a plan in your back pocket. So I have a few go-to openers. I have a few openers that I can use if I don't come up with anything. However, most of the time the way I open is by going up and then seeing what the opponent gives me. So, or the opponent gives me, I'm looking, I'm thinking in the chess, chess analogy already, seeing what the girl gives me in this case. <laughs> it's funny, girl, opponent, opponent, chess player. Um, but you want to, you want to see what the girl gives you. So my typical opener is going to be something like, um, hey, excuse me. And that's it. Hey, excuse me. And then pay attention, see how she responds. And then depending on how she responds, I'm going to interact accordingly. And I trust myself to operate from there. Now, if I say, hey, excuse me, and I'm getting nothing, then, or I'm not getting anything that I seem to be able to work with, then maybe I'll follow up with a stock opener. Hey, excuse me, I need your opinion on something, yada, yada, yada. Hey, excuse me, I got to go in a minute, but you seemed interesting. I wanted to find out if you're crazy, for example. Um, that's not even a stock opener I have, but it could work. So you will use one of these stock things as a backup, but it's not your plan. It's not your go-to, it's your just-in-case. Um, and I think that's a good way to have a plan. So now I'm going to give some interesting sort of theories on chess openings and philosophies behind them and explain how they relate to game as well because I think this this can get pretty insightful pretty quickly. Um, and the answer to what opening to play in chess is a very personal one. It's a very, um, there are a lot of unique philosophies and unique ideas on exactly how to do it. And each of these different philosophies and ideas have their pros and their cons, okay? So one philosophy would be that when you're learning, you should just play the best moves, the quote unquote best moves. Um, and in chess is very easy. You'd, you'd get a high powered chess computer and you just like crank it up to, to extreme depth and you just look at what is the computer rate is best and you just play the best move in every situation. Now, that seems like that should empirically be the right thing to do, right? You're playing the best move. Um, what's wrong with this? Well, there's a couple problems with this. One problem with this is depending what your opponent plays, you're going to be playing wildly different things every single game. And you can only memorize moves so far. You can memorize maybe up to move like, you know, four or five of most common variations you're going to get. And, and maybe up to like move like 10 or 12 or so of like the really, really common lines um, pretty realistically. But if every single game you're playing is completely different, as soon as you reach the end of those memorized lines, you're going to be in completely unfamiliar territory and you're not going to know strategically how to play that game. So while the computer may empirically rate that position as good, um, if you don't know how to play it, if you don't know the strategies of that position, if you don't know the nuances of that position, if you don't understand what the computer was even doing with the previous three moves and don't understand the plan, well, then um, you're going to be really left hanging and you might not be so well off. You'd probably be better off playing something that's slightly less optimal, but that you understand it so that once your memorization runs out, you can actually follow through. Um, so that's, that's one aspect is the best thing to do on the open is only as good as you are to follow it up. So for example, I might, as an advanced guy, want an opener that's very polarizing and will elicit shit tests because that's going to allow me to convey my personality very, very quickly. It's going to initiate uh, banter very, very quickly as well. However, if you are a beginner and you're terrified of shit tests, that's probably not a very good opener for you. So even if it's the empirically best way to game, it might not be the best way for you to game. It also might not be the best way to game in every scenario. So doing something rather polarizing might be a great way in general to work a cold approach scenario, but it might be a terrible way to work a social circle scenario. So if you work what are just like blindly the best moves or the best lines, they might not be properly calibrated in that situation, or you might not personally know how to follow through with them. And so that can actually be very, very problematic in a practical sense. The other thing that can come up, or actually, well, when we're talking about knowing lines and not knowing lines, that, come, that brings up another opening philosophy which is the idea of um, trying to have an opener that forces certain lines. So for example, um, in chess, there are certain openings 
where you can where you're going to kind of make contact with the opponent's position right away. So maybe there will be um, a threat within like on move two, maybe you're attacking a piece on the second move. Well, that automatically very much narrows and dictates the responses your opponent can give because he probably has to protect that piece. Whereas if you have an opening where you're developing on your side of the board and he's developing on his side of the board and your pieces aren't coming into contact, well, now the range of available moves to your opponent is tremendously large. And so it's it becomes like exponentially harder to prepare against all the different possibilities. And you're probably going to run into a lot of positions you're not familiar with and a lot of things you haven't seen before, which is fine because your opponent also can't prepare for all the possibilities and he may not be aware of everything that's going to come up either, but understand that you're going to be able to rely a lot less on kind of opening theory in that kind of a scenario. Same kind of a thing with a girl. If your opening strategy doesn't make a lot of contact with the girl, if it doesn't force things in any way, if it doesn't create action, then you're going to be in a very random situation. A lot of your, your interactions, your sets are going to be very, very different. So if your plan is to have five minutes of small talk and then show premise for the first time and then, you know, make it man to woman for the first time after five minutes, by the time you get to five minutes, by the time you get to the relevant part of the game, every single interaction you're having is already wildly different. On the other hand, in an extreme case the other way, if you were to walk up to a girl and you were to open with pretending she's your ex-girlfriend, like, oh my God, wait, what are you, what are you doing here? I thought you didn't, I thought you hated these kind of places. And you start like talking to her like that and like truly pretending like she's your ex from moment one and not even like when she's like, who, who are you? How do I know you? You're like, oh my God, like I know we ended badly, but like, you don't have to act like you don't know me. That's a little, that's a little extreme, don't you think? And truly playing it up. There's only so many different threads you can get and you're going to have a very similar start to the conversation very much because you're dictating certain things. Or if you opened with like, um, hey, you seem like trouble, which is an old, old opener I used to use a ton, um, that dictates certain conversational threads. So that the, that's an example of making contact early in the opening and dictating things. And in game in general, the more you can dictate things, um, at least the more predictable things are going to be um, and the more you're going to be in control of it. It's not to say that it's always the best. There are situations where it's not, but there is some value to it. Um, the problem, though, in-game um, is that when you do these openers that are dictating things, you're also kind of, um, what's the word, you're telegraphing that it's game very early on, so you are potentially losing some value. So you're trading off a little bit of inherent value for a lot of predictability and a lot of progress in the interaction. And that's a philosophical decision. How much do you care about making progress in the interaction versus how much do you care about maintaining value and then you trust yourself to deal with it later? And in general, in, in game as well as in the game chess, the more sophisticated you are, the more able you are to gain an advantage from an even position or from a neutral position, the longer you can wait and the more you maybe even should wait before really telegraphing your interest, right? You should be a lot more subtle about it if you are more highly skilled, more highly advanced. If you're more of a beginner, you should just get to the point. So extreme example of this, if you are an extreme beginner, but you've worked on your opening, opening with something very direct, like, hey, you're really cute, I wanted to come say hi to you, and just like meaning it, and then probably trying to close relatively quickly may actually be one of your best strategies because staying a long time is likely to end up with you not doing as well in the actual interaction. On the other hand, if you are extremely skilled and potentially you're maybe approaching a group set where there might be some resistance, other friends might have issues with you going straight up and like targeting a girl and like, um, you know, hitting on her from moment one. In that case, getting to another group, building some value, throwing off a tease here and there, and then being a little indirect about things is probably an actually better approach for you because the longer you spend in her presence, the longer you spend with her group, um, the more tension you can build before you show interest the better off you're going to be. And you're going to be able to handle all those variables very well because you're a more advanced guy. So keep in mind that your skill level is going to dictate what the best opening is as well. Um, one final, there's actually a lot more I could say on chess openings, but I'm not going to nerd out too, too, too much on this, on this audio and video. Um, I really could though, actually. Um, but okay. So one other thing that I will say about chess openings, and, and this goes to some of my own personal opening theory is that there are, um, in chess, there's what's called the main lines, the lines that are very commonly played, the lines that are very computer approved and like the grandmasters play them and stuff like that. Um, and the thing about those lines is they are empirically the best by like an infinitesimal margin. By some tiny fraction, they are the best. Um, but there are lines that are just beneath those that are not quite the main lines that are almost as good. But the advantage is 
your opponent hasn't prepared against them because they're unexpected, they're uncommon lines. And so when I'm devising my own particular opening repertoire, what I usually try and do is I try and get those lines that are almost as good as the main lines, almost as good as the established lines that everybody's prepared against and knows the first 15 moves of, um, but I don't want to memorize 15 moves of every possible variation. So instead, I take um, an unusual, almost as good move at some point early on, and then we're in a situation where maybe I haven't maximized my advantage right at that point, but I still am okay. I still either have minimized my disadvantages black or, or kept some advantages white, hopefully. Um, and it's a position I'm familiar with and have seen before, and my opponent hasn't. And so everything from there on, I'm going to do theoretically better than him through experience and whatnot. And there's a lot of value in your opener to how well you can follow up from it, okay? And also from how much you're taking your opponents out of their comfort zone. So same kind of thing um, when you're talking to a girl. The more you can kind of make an impression on a girl with your opener, the more you can um, make the conversation unique with the opener as opposed to a boring small talk conversation, um, the more you can kind of have the girl a little off balance and make the conversation more memorable in that way, right off the opener, the better off you're going to be. Um, so it's not about trying to say the exact perfect thing um, necessarily always um, with a girl. It's about saying the thing that is um, that's simple and familiar for you, but is going to put her just enough outside of average everyday conversation so that it is a little bit memorable. And that's really what you're going for. Um, you don't want to be like, if the example would be if you are like so scripted that you came off as though you're quoting Shakespeare, that would be way too weird and way too much and, and unusual and bad. Right. Or if you came off, like everything you say came straight out of a Hollywood movie, that would be technically really good game, but it's really like kind of obvious and predictable. And it's also kind of like, off-putting in its fakeness, right? You want to be genuine and unusual enough while still um, while still triggering a lot of the good responses and while still generally moving in the right direction. Um, the best way to open, I'll, I'll end it with this, the best way to open, which I'm going to get away from Chester, I'm just going to go directly game on this, the best way to open is typically um, to do something that is fairly simple and gets a response and that you can personally follow up with and that you can personally live with and it doesn't give your value away too much. That's what you genuinely, generally want to do. Um, and the best idea is to have an idea. The best idea isn't to think in terms of opening lines, but think in terms of opening ideas. And this actually relates back to chess as well. I, I mentioned knowing the strategies for the positions, right? having sort of opening ideas. So for example, I may know that in the first 30 seconds, I want to establish some level of cockiness. I want to be a little bit dismissive, but at the same time, I want to indicate some kind of complementariness or something that indicates the girl is, is female to me, right? Those are the three things I want to do in the first 30 seconds. So regardless of what I open with, I'm going to have things that I follow the opener with that are going to lead me down that path. And I'll have a variety of different ones of those. And similar to the opener, some of those will be canned. Some of those will be things I pre-planned. And some of those will be things that are coming up spontaneously on the spot. Um, and then some of them will be similar to things I've said before, et cetera, et cetera. So it can all get very, very complex. But the key thing with any of this, um, with an opener, um, opening in game, with an opening in chess, et cetera, is to know what you want to accomplish. Have a clear idea of what you're trying to accomplish and then keep going in that direction. Um, and so um, I'll go one more time to the, <laughs> one more time to the chess openings, I guess here, um, which is that every opening has an idea. So this guy in this question, he mentioned the Danish gambit, right? Danish gambit is a pretty aggressive gambit. We're going to gambit at least one pawn, even two pawns. So you're giving your opponent one or two of your pawns right up at the start. So you're accepting that disadvantage. And the idea is that you're going to get peace mobility off of it. You're going to get your pieces developed on better squares. Hopefully you'll get some kind of an attack out of it. That's the idea of, of a gambit in general. Now, where you could go really wrong is if you didn't understand that. If you play an opening where you're giving up two pawns and then you play slowly and don't put any pressure on your opponent and just let him catch up in development, now you've just given away two pawns for nothing. So in playing the Danish Gambit, if you don't play actively, if you don't get an attack out of it, you're losing against good competition every single time. If you do get an attack, you could be all right. Um, same thing, there are other openings that are very positional. They're based on like getting small positional concessions and winning an end game. If you play that opening and then you try and attack, attack, attack and go for it, you're going to overextend and lose. 
So it's very important that the opening that you play be congruent with how you want things to go afterwards. If you're a positional player in chess, play a positional opening. If you're an attacking player, an aggressive player, play an aggressive opening. Same thing in game. If you like interactions that are very, very man to woman and very, very charged, you should go with an opener and first 30 seconds that is quite polarizing and that does make your man to woman you know, elements very obvious or at least apparent to some degree. On the other hand, if you're more of a finesse player, so to speak, um, you could go with more of a small talk thing and just start subtly inserting little man to woman barbs and subtly like frame controlling and subtly leading the conversation in various ways and get a very, very good result. But it would be a little bit of a slower build and that's going to deal with what your, what your skills in game are and also what your temperament in game is. So what is the answer to what opening should you play in chess? Um, well, I could tell you the ones I play and stuff, but the real answer is it depends on you. It depends on you. It depends on how much you're willing to memorize. It depends on whether you want to be forcing or not at the start or whether you're willing to like play a little bit of unfamiliar position. It depends what type of game you want to end up with. It, it may depend who your opponent is. Are you playing for a draw or a win, for example, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all these different factors and it really depends. Same thing in game, right? What is the situation? Who is the girl? What types of interactions do you like? Um, what opening conversations you're familiar with versus unfamiliar with. Um, things like, uh, what is your, what is your skill level, right? Do you want to be very direct because more time in set is not going to help you as much because you're kind of a beginner or do you want to be more indirect because every single minute you spend with the girl is going to be building more and more and more value. So there isn't a right or wrong opening choice per se, but there are right or wrong general ideas around opening, depending on all these factors, like where you're at in game, what you're looking to do, who the girl is, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that helps you to take kind of a holistic approach. I actually, in terms of chess opening theory, only scratch the surface. In terms of game opening theory, probably only scratch the surface there as well. Um, but I hope it was informative. I'm sorry if I leaned really heavily on that metaphor, but I liked it a lot. I liked the fact that he was asking that question in that way because I do like the analogy. I hadn't really thought of that analogy to compare chess openers with game openers, but I do think there are a lot of similarities and I'm glad I got asked it. So thank you again, Mr. LM, um, initials LM. Uh, I appreciate that. And um, that is a very verbal game topic, which brings me to uh, one more thing I wanted to address to you guys on this, this program, which is that verbal game is coming soon. Um, we're going to be releasing it in the very near future. You can get a free sneak peek uh, almost an hour long infield video at verbalgameacademy.com. So go check it out there. And also by, by going there, you won't miss any of the updates, the exclusive content that's coming out over the next month or so. So I highly encourage you to check that out. Um, I also highly encourage you to ask questions for this podcast. We do use your questions and how, how cool would it be if you're a regular listener of this, uh, this show? And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, that's my question he's answering. So let that be you. It's not that hard. Um, send in a question, ideally send it via audio. If it's a good question, if it's on topic, um, generally any good game question will be on topic. In particular, we're going to take verbal game related questions probably for the ne next couple shows. So that's a little hint. Um, but any really good question is potentially answerable and audio questions are preferred. So send them in. I would love to hear from you and thank you once again for tuning in. Take care and I'll talk to you next time. We'll